Did the ancient ghost of a nun really predict a baron's brutal and humiliating death? And do the spirits of the other side really have the power to temporarily blind you? Who knows, but these are just some of the legends that have surrounded Tamworth Castle for generations. So come sit by me because we are getting all into the bloody history of this ancient Mercian stronghold and some of the ghostly tenants from centuries ago that still call this place home. Hello friend, how is your day going today? Are you doing good? Are you staying hydrated? If you are new around here, hello, welcome, hi. My name is Claire and I am a lover of all things morbid, mysterious and macabre. I have spent hours and hours absolutely enthralled in ghost hunting TV shows. But you know what I love more than night vision cameras and EVPs? I love the history behind a paranormal encounter, the origins of urban legends, and the real, raw, personal ghost stories that people experience firsthand. And so that is what we're gonna do. Every week, we sit down and swap ghost stories like a good old sleepover. So if that is your scene, I would highly recommend that you subscribe so that you never miss one of our chats. Sources this week, there was one particular book. I think it was like a really old book that's been like reprinted. So this one is Tamworth Castle. It's foundation, it's history and it's lords from the Norman conquest to the present day. And it's written by a Reverend Henry Norris of Tamworth. And I mean, yeah, it is an old book. It was published in 1899 and it cost a shilling. So I think it is definitely a reprint, but it was really good for like all of the history bits and like sorting out dates and stuff. So highly recommend recommend that if you are interested in Tamworth Castle. And for the ghost parts, I have like compilation sort of books and that's where I got a lot of the stories from. So there was Haunted Staffordshire by Philip Solomon and Haunted Castles of Britain and Ireland by Richard Jones. And there was also a book, I think it was called like Ghosts of Staffordshire by David Bell, but I forgot to bring that in here and I wasn't about to just tear down all of that to go and get it, so. And I actually didn't realize until I started reading the book that the copy that I'd picked up, like secondhand, was actually signed by David Bell. So anyway, are you ready to go ridiculously far back in time? Of course you are, that's why you're here. So come, sit by me, get your snacks, get your water, because we are about to get into it. And a lot of the history for Tamworth Castle, okay, it is old. Like, I feel like the 17th century is quite far back in history, but no, we are going back to like triple digits years. And so a lot of the facts and like the specific numbers kind of get a little convoluted, but just bear with me. We will learn on this journey together. <laughs> so Tamworth is a very old town. It's kind of like right in the middle of England, really. It's sort of like to the east of Birmingham. And they don't have a super clear idea of Tamworth's like ancient history, naturally, but they do believe that it might have been quite like important way Way before even records began, which is pretty cool, right? Archaeologists know by the discovery of like flint tools in the area that the Celts might have potentially used Tamworth as a settlement. Again, it's just like an educated guess, it's just speculation, but the time of the Celts was between like 600 BC and 43 AD when the Romans finally decided that they wanted a slice of the English life. So the town of Tamworth is potentially absolutely ancient. And I mean, it is pretty ancient anyway, like even from the time that the records began, like I would say that's quite a long time ago. But it wasn't until the Anglo-Saxons fought back against the Romans and established the Kingdom of Mercia, which would go on to be one of the most powerful kingdoms in England. And the capital of Mercia was Tamworth. And it's funny, I grew up about 15, 20 minutes away from Tamworth. So like there I was, I about did a backflip when I was playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla, like you know, the Viking one. And we were going all like through Mercia and like the town of Repton as well and like seeing all of the names of these towns that I recognize now, like it's a special moment. So the earliest records state that the first king of Mercia was a man called Creoda in 522. Now obviously a king of a new kingdom, you need like a pad to do all your kingly things from, don't you? So he was cited as building a fortress in Tamworth. And then a man named Offa came to the throne in 757. And he went on to be like one of the most powerful kings in the entire Saxon era. So early on in his reign, he built what was described as like a palace at Tamworth. And it was most likely gonna be constructed out of stone because that was just what they'd started doing with like the churches in that area. And so from then on, Tamworth Palace was like super important to the king 
kings and queens, like they would use Tamworth as like the place to spend Easter and Christmases, which I'm guessing is kind of like how, like in previous years, the royal family of today, they would like spend Easter in Windsor and Christmas at Sandringham. But like, obviously now we've got King Charles and he might decide he wants to do something different. But the point is that like the royal family, they like to go to like another one of their castles for like important Christian dates. However, it would not stay rosy at Tamworth for long because in 874, the Vikings had arrived, they'd sailed over, they'd realized how easy the pickings were over here and they'd started raiding inland. They were basically just getting more and more confident, like going further inland, like raiding the towns and villages and obviously the monasteries. And it was like taking candy from a little Anglo-Saxon baby. I don't know. Apparently Tamworth was lost to the Danes at this time and for apparently like 40 years it lay as a quote mass of blackened ruins until King Alfred the Great came along in 871 and basically like beat back the Vikings and his daughter Ethelfled had actually been married off to Ethelred the Unready, the Lord of the Mercians and when he died in 911, not not that 9-11, as in the year 9-11. She became the Lady of the Mercians and she was actually the only female ruler in Anglo-Saxon history. Good on you, girl. Like, making waves for the women. We love a strong female character over here. So in 913, Ethelred, she went about like refortifying Tamworth. Like she built a new fort on top of like this ancient mound and that was called a mot. And in Henry Norris's book, like the really old one, he speculated that maybe it was like a super old barrow, like an ancient burial ground from like pagans years and years ago, which is very strategic. Like it's very smart to put your fort like high up on a hill. But if it was a burial ground, ghosts, you know? She wouldn't get to enjoy it for very long though as Ethelfled died in 918 in Tamworth. Obviously the threat of those heathen Vikings was ever present at this point. So by now Ethelfled's brother, Edward the Elder, his son Ethelstan was king of the Saxons. He decided to make a treaty with the pagan Viking prince of Northumbria. Basically, don't attack us and you can marry my sister Editha. Editha, that sounds like well common. Editha, her name was Editha. So in 920. Seven, Editha and this Prince Citric got hitched. Citric was baptized. Like everyone thought things were going well. Like he was a good Christian man now. Turns out that wasn't the case. Apparently the marriage was never consummated and Citric renounced Christianity and relapsed back into paganism. Like as if it was like an addiction or something. He relapsed into paganism. Like we found him at the side of the street overdosing on paganism. I don't know, that, that's dumb. Shut up, Claire. Editha decided that she was just like completely done at this point, like didn't think I was that bad to make you completely renounce this newfound faith that you'd found, but okay. So she went away out of public life and she founded an abbey in Polesworth, which isn't too far away from Tamworth. It's like 10 minutes down the road where basically she lived as a nun for the rest of her life until she died in the 960s. And now I know it seems like I'm getting like super specific about a family that's like not technically now to do with Tamworth Castle, but trust me, all will become clear very soon. Because trouble, it was a Bruin. In 1066, the Normans invaded and William the Conqueror did what he did best conquer. He beat the Saxons, he bumped off the Vikings, and it was now the Normans show for like the next 300 years. So once the Normans had taken over, King William gave Tamworth to one of his best mates, a man called Robert Dispenser. Right, actually, I'm not even exaggerating when I say that every single book called him by a different name. Every single one. He was Robert Dispenser. He was Roger Lamarmian. He was Robert de Marmion. In one book, he was even Rodbert. Like, I don't know what I can do with that. So just take your pick on what you want to call him. I'm going to call him Robert Marmion. Basically, he was a guy, he was loyal to William the Conqueror and he was given Tamworth Castle to say, cheers mate, you did good. And so began the occupancy of the Marmions at Tamworth Castle. And for that initial confusion, their names are actually super easy to remember. There were six Marmions that lived at Tamworth Castle. The first five were called Robert, give or take different history books. And the sixth Marmion was Philip. Robert, 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 Philip. 
Way to go, Philip, you booked the trend. So finally, it's at this point that the castle that you can see today is built by the first Robert Marmion in 1070. And that was the briefest I could make the history of Tamworth leading up to what you can see today. Honestly, I am so terrible at making things brief. I just find it all so interesting. And then it's only when I've got like books strewn out around my laptop and I'm like 3000 words deep into the introduction and I stop myself and I think, is this too much? I just like being thorough. That's all I can say. Like, so please tell me in the comments, what do you think? Do you find it as interesting as I do to give like such a whole picture? Please tell me I'm not alone in this. So the shiny new castle, like that was still on top of the artificial mound, just like the castle that Ethelfled had built because like, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Because like, if you're gonna be besieged, you wanna make it as hard as possible for the enemy to infiltrate, obviously. And there's nothing that's gonna be more tiring for a soldier, like think with his like heavy gear and his weapons and stuff, to walk up like a really super steep hill. That's clever, right? And this would come in handy during the Barons Revolt in 1215 and then again, again in the English Civil War in 1643. And the castle would be added to and changed like as the needs changed through the years, as it turned from just like this stronghold into basically a family home. The Marmions would occupy Tamworth Castle until like 1294, and then the Freeville family would take it over. After that, the Ferrers family took it on in 1493. And it's interesting just like looking at all of these dates, like just how long the castle stayed within a family. Like it would have been the family home for like multiple generations, like hundreds of years. But it would have been the Ferrers that really like basically remodeled Tamworth Castle from its like battle ready fortress that Marmion had built into more of a Tudor family home fit for such an upstanding family that could like basically brag about their wealth of like how wealthy they are. Like look at how great my castle is. And like it would end up in the Townsend family's hands, which was kind of like the descendants of the Ferrers just by like marriage. So like which kid it got passed down to and whatnot, but this was like 1714 and apparently like the interior of the castle was in need of some investment. So one of the Townsend's George, he actually invested everything that he had into making the castle livable again, but it was all for nothing. He actually died before it was all finished and on his death was declared bankrupt. Like he had these mountains of debt that he'd put himself into just to be able to renovate the castle. By 1897 though, there was this guy called John Villiers Stuart Townsend and he decided he was done with the castle. Like he just wanted to sell it off. At this point, they'd had tenants in the castle anyway. They were like renting it out to other people, but like he decided, nah, we're done, let's cut ties. So the people of Tamworth basically like they got together and they told the mayor that he needed to buy the castle to basically like keep it protected. And so that's exactly what they did. On the 8th of June, 1897, the mayor and like corporation, which was basically like the council, they bought Tamworth Castle for 3000 pounds so that they could preserve the castle in commemoration for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, which was that year, 1897. So two years after that, in 1899, the castle was opened as a museum and it has been open to the public ever since then. But it is really nuts to think about that like people were still living in Tamworth Castle like all the way up to the 1890s. It's like, oh, so where do you live then? Like, oh yeah, you see that castle on like the top of the hill? There, mate. And so let's chat a little bit about the castle itself that you can actually go and tour around today. Day. It's got like all of the ingredients that make up like a standard issue castle. It's got like the great hall where they would have hosted banquets and it's got like multiple separate living quarters so that the noble family of the castle could like host the royal family if they came to visit. It's got galleries and battlements and it actually had glass windows too, which was quite rare at the time as glass was super expensive. And of course it has a dungeon. Well, okay, so we say dungeon, but it's not like the whole torture chamber, like hundreds of executions kind of place. The dungeon is situated in like the base of the Norman Tower that was built, which was kind of deemed to be like the safest place in the entire castle when it came to things like sieges and whatnot. Like it had like super thick walls, but it wasn't really set up as a dungeon. It was more than likely just like this really secure storeroom that potentially held prisoners when the need occasionally arose kind of thing. And even so it's like, a, it's a pretty dingy little room. So it wouldn't have been nice to be chained up there. I remember because 
because like I went to school so close to the place. Like we used to go on like quite a few school trips out there. And I'm pretty sure I'm remembering it correctly that like you'd walk into the, the dungeon and there used to be a bucket with a plastic poo at the bottom of it. Like that doesn't add anything to the story. I just vaguely remember it being there in the dungeon. And so now it's a museum. Like you've got a bunch of different rooms all set up differently. So there's like a Tudor dining room and the bedrooms and like these beautiful wood paneled rooms. And the museum really does a good job of like showing you how the castle would have been used throughout the years by like the family that would have been living in it and their private staff too. They also have a regular loan of the Staffordshire Hoard, which if you don't know, it was this like huge archaeological find in Lichfield, which is literally like 15 minutes away from the castle. And I think it was like the biggest collection of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver like ever found or something nuts like that. Like some metal detectorist guy, he was just like out metal detectoring in a field that had just been plowed and just found all of this treasure. I think about him sometimes. I hope he did a little dance. Like the amount of ring pulls and pot cans and like Hot Wheels cars that he would have found in the farmer's fields over the years. And then he just gets this little ding and he finds like the Staffordshire hoard. That's a payoff and a half for all his metal detectoring work over the years. But they also have like loads of other things on at Tamworth Castle. One time I went over there, it was for something like Tamworth Castle by Candlelight. And honestly, when I tell you, it was magical. Just the whole castle is like lit with candles. It was so cute. But I didn't see a ghost, which I would say that I was disappointed by, but with my history with the place, I was kind of relieved because if I had seen this apparition that I'm about to tell you about, I think I would have spent a lot of money on therapy by now. So remember our guy, Robert Marmion, you know, the first one that took Tamworth Castle like back in 1070 and like built it. Obviously he was a Norman, he'd come from Normandy in Northern France and he'd been given Tamworth by the king, right? So having Saxons living close by that they had literally just defeated in battle probably wasn't an ideal situation. Like that isn't gonna help you to relax in your new pad kind of thing. So this was apparently the reason why he ordered that the nuns at Polesworth Abbey should be kicked out and most likely replaced by Normans. Now you remember, like, it's all coming back now, Polesworth Abbey, the one that was founded by Editha. Yeah, you remember it, you're smart, it's all, it's all connecting now, it's starting to make sense. So time went on and nothing really happened, like the nuns had been kicked out and then now we're at the point where the third Robert Marmion is living in the castle. Now word on the street is that this Marmion is a bit of a tool to be honest. He is actually recorded in history as being pretty much like a wicked and immoral man. And so the story goes that the nuns were so outraged by that first Marmion's actions and now how evil this Marmion was that they'd been like furiously praying to Editha who had now been made a saint. And when I say like furiously praying, I don't mean like fast and furious, like racing through their prayers. I mean, they were like angry, like fuming that they'd been kicked out of their abbey. And it's said that the nuns angry prayers, like called St. Editha out from her grave, who then visited the third Robert Marmion while he was in bed asleep at Tamworth Castle. The story goes that the entity woke him up and told him that he was going to die a painful death if he didn't reinstate Polesworth Abbey and let the nuns back in. And apparently just for good measure, she smacked him on the side with her crozier, leaving this like a horrible wound on his side that wouldn't stop bleeding. And a crozier is like a staff, kind of like the symbolism of being like the good shepherd kind of thing, which would have been held by an abbess of the time. According to the story, his cries of pain in the middle of the night from being smacked in the side were loud enough to wake the entire castle. But when I say this man did not get the memo, Thinking that he'd just had this weird dream and he'd like just fallen out of bed or something, he tried to put the whole weird experience behind him and carry on, but that wound in his side just would not heal. And he was in so much pain. Like even his friends were like, dude, like you're crawling on the floor in pain and you say a ghost nun did this to you? I think you need Jesus. His pals strongly recommended that he should potentially think about confessing himself to a priest and like maybe restoring the nuns to this abbey. Eventually the pain got too much and he finally agreed like, we're gonna try anything at this point. So this third Robert Marmion, he did like a full Ebenezer Scrooge. He did a complete 180. He confessed himself to a priest. He tried to be a better man and he gave the Abbey back to the nuns. And what do you know? Apparently the wound on his side stopped bleeding and healed up completely. 
However, he would go on to die four years later in what I am guessing was a painful death as he was killed in battle with the Earl of Chester in 1144. And I mean, he was like thrown from his horse and broke his femur bone, which I'm pretty sure is like the most painful bone you can break, like your thigh. And then it got even worse. Obviously, I'm, I'm laughing. You shouldn't laugh. It's not funny. Obviously, he couldn't fight or really move. Like he'd got this broken thigh. So he just got beheaded by some random foot soldier. So yeah, I would say that that's a pretty painful painful and humiliating death, possibly foreshadowed by the ghost of the nun. Like, it would be funny. It's not funny. It's not funny. Stop saying it's funny. But it would be funny if she kind of, like, knew this was going to happen regardless. But she was like, mm, I can see an opportunity here for him to do some good before his sticky ending. Like, quick, make up a story that he can avoid this death if he lets the nuns back into that abbey I set up. But that wasn't the only story of the ghost of St. Editha haunting the castle. She has actually been seen multiple times and is known as the Black Lady, which makes sense that she's in, like, the Black nun's habit and all of that. She's sometimes spotted on the haunted staircase after midnight. And some say that she was actually captured in a photo from the 1940s where you can see this like weird looking shadow on the stairs, which I guess, yeah, you could potentially see a nun looking figure, like maybe stooped over or something, but let me know what you think. And honestly, like I'm talking about St. Editha and like trying to stay cool, but I am kind of getting chills a little bit talking about St. Editha so much because this was my childhood trauma. Let me explain to you. So back in like the early 2000s, there used to be like a bunch of mannequins in different parts of the castle. And one was set up in what was known as the ladies chamber or the haunted bedroom, which was the same bedroom where Baron Marmion had his ghostly visit from St. Editha, hence why it's known as the haunted bedroom. So there was this mannequin of Marmion in bed. And there was like, it was either like a black figure or like a black sheet or something standing by the bed. Like, please bear with me. I think they took them out like 15 years ago. So it's been a while, like they're not there anymore. But if you remember what it is I'm going on about or like you have a photo or something, please, please share your story in the comments down below or send me a photo like either to my email or my Instagram, don't scare Claire, because I tried for hours to find a video or like even a photo somewhere of this scene with the mannequins. And I couldn't, which was so annoying because for all the trauma it caused me, like I would absolutely love to see a photo of that setup. And I'll post it to my socials too, if I can find one or if anyone sends me one because I need you to share in this, okay? <laughs> So this setup, it must have been on some sort of like motion sensor or something, but like when you'd walk into the bedroom, a face would be projected onto this like black sheet or like figure, I can't really remember. So it would look like the ghost of the nun had just appeared. So anyway, I was at Tamworth Castle, I think I was like seven, eight years old, and we were on one of these school trips to the castle. And I was really drawn to something in that haunted bedroom. I think I was like looking at a painting or something. And it was at that moment, like I realized that the group had moved on and I was completely alone. And I panicked because we had literally just been told the story of St. Editha and that she was a ghost that visited Robert while he was in that very room. So I started running because I don't remember much, but I do remember that I absolutely could not be in that haunted bedroom on my own. Like the ghost was gonna get me. I was young and dumb. There was a 50-50 chance. There was doors on either side of the bedroom and I chose wrong. I went the wrong way and ended up going into like the servant's room, like through the haunted bedroom, which is a dead end. There's there's nowhere to go but back through the haunted bedroom. So I was like, oh, poop sticks or like whatever curse words I knew back then. I tried to minimize my time in that haunted bedroom as much as I could. So I decided I would keep my eyes on the floor and I would run through to the other side because that must be like the way out. Okay, game on, I can do this. I start running and I go to the other side of the bedroom. And I don't really know what happened here, but I remember getting to the other side and again, I couldn't see the group and it looked like another dead end to me too. In reality, there probably just was like an open door or something, but like, I just completely missed it. But now I was looking around like, oh, stinky poop sticks. Like this is another dead end. Like where am I supposed to go? I must have missed the door. There must have been another door in the haunted bedroom that I've just completely missed. But that meant that this time I couldn't run through it looking at the floor. I had to look up. I needed to find this damn door. But I still wasn't that keen on being in that bedroom for very long. Like it did have a horrible feeling to it. So I put on this brisk pace. I was looking around like trying to find the door. And again, ended up straight through back into the original dead end room, the servant's room. I just, I saw the servant's room. I was like, nope, straight back out. There's something missing here. And I walked back into the haunted bedroom. Like I was all completely turned around. I didn't know how I'd managed to trap myself in a completely open museum, but here I was. And then there she was, Lord Marmion, 
Lord Marmion, take heed. And I can tell you, with absolute certainty, that those were the first words that that motion detector projection, St. Editha, says. And it was quite loud. So I looked up, in absolute horror, to see the terrifying, pale face of St. Editha looking down at Lord Marmion in bed, and by extension, little seven-year-old Claire that was on the other side of that bed. And I can't remember much after that, but... I went into shock. I think a staff member like found me just outside the haunted bedroom. And I kind of remember rejoining the group back in the long gallery, which is now the Battle and Tribute exhibition, I believe. And like I joined the group and someone looked at me and they were like, you're really pale. You look like you've seen a ghost. And I mean, I might as well have. But for the next two weeks after that experience, I slept with the light on and I had paralyzing night terrors about said Editha and her visit to Lord Marmion's bedchamber. I haven't thought about that story in that much detail in about 15 years. When I was thinking back to being able to put this story into the video, I had to stop halfway through. I think it had got to like 10 o'clock at night and I was just completely creeped out. Like I felt that same visceral fear that I'd felt for weeks after that and that the black lady was gonna be waiting at the top of the landing for me or like I'd go around the corner and see the black figure of a nun in a dark bedroom. So that is how Tamworth Castle traumatized me, even though it wasn't really paranormal. But there are plenty of instances of paranormal activity at Tamworth Castle. So aside from the black lady that's been seen on the staircase, they also have a white lady. And the story goes that the white lady, she was a woman that was basically kidnapped and kept at the castle by a Sir Tarquin, who was allegedly the bodyguard of King James I. But it seems that there was a little more going on between them. Maybe some might say a little Stockholm syndrome going on. But apparently a little love affair had grown between the two. In what could have potentially been a rescue bid, this guy, Sir Lancelot, had challenged Sir Tarquin to a duel to the death. And Sir Tarquin didn't come out great in it. He was apparently killed by Sir Lancelot. And this lady, like she was watching from like the parapet walk as the duel was going on, on the castle grounds below like she could obviously see these guys dueling. When she saw that her lover had been beaten, she apparently threw herself off the castle walls and fell to her death below. Now, there are different versions of this story too, that she was Tarquin's mistress or that she eventually died of grief or that Sir Tarquin and Lancelot were actually the very same Knights of the Round Table from King Arthur's Camelot. Like, there's a bunch of different variations. But what everyone seems to agree on is that the ghost of this white lady continues to haunt the castle. Like she's been seen as a full body apparition wearing this like long white dress and apparently she's been spotted in the ladies chamber, that haunted bedroom, and also on the top of the battlements that she threw herself from. And you can sometimes hear weeping and wailing coming <laughs> from that parapet walk. And if you stand there for too long, you may feel the rustle of like an old fashioned dress push past you. And Most Haunted actually visited Tamworth Castle in like 2003. And their historian put forth the theory that the white lady wasn't anything to do with Sir Tarquin at all. He speculated that it may have been Ethelfled herself who did actually die at Tamworth Castle. And that maybe she would have been like, weeping at like the state of Mercia with like the whole Viking drama going on at that point. So that could be another theory. And while those are the only specific entities that we know a little bit about, there are other perhaps darker energies haunting the ancient castle. One entity is described as malevolent and is known to cause temporary blindness. Two workers were up in the long gallery, which is now where like the Staffordshire Horde bit is, and they both saw this formless blue mist moving towards them. One worker felt a really sharp like stabbing pain in his face, and he claimed that he was completely temporarily blinded. Like he just could not see anything. After this thing had apparently attacked one of the guys, it flew around the room before flying off out of a window. In another story, a museum assistant walked into, again, that same room in the museum, and she felt like this weird sensation all over her like face and neck. She thought that like somehow she had like got a bunch of sand in her eyes. So like she looked down expecting to see like, I don't know, like plaster off the ceiling or something like all on the floor, but there was nothing there. So she looked back up just in time to see this formless white cloud moving around the room before again disappearing out of the window. And that was an interesting story to me about that, about how she felt like this weird dust in her eyes, because it kind of reminded me of how the Black Monk of Pontefract started. And if you haven't seen that one, then you need to get that queued up after this one because 
It was a ride. But the gist of what I'm getting at is that when the paranormal activity started in Pontefract, there was like this weird layer of like white chalky dust covering a particular spot in their living room. Like it was enough to leave a film of this powder or whatever on the grandma's cup of tea. So it's interesting, like maybe it's a similar phenomenon and maybe the museum assistant just like walked through the cloud at the wrong time. Like, I don't know, just an interesting connection that my brain made. But these myths seem to be quite common in the castle. One of these apparitions was apparently captured on CCTV floating around the Great Hall one time. Obviously like seeing that on the CCTV, they thought like, yeah, that's a bit weird. Bit odd, not what you'd expect like a smudge to be there if there was one on the camera or something. So they went down into the Great Hall to investigate, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. Like there was nothing wrong with the camera, like everything was in its place and obviously no mist. The only thing that they did comment on was that there was this abnormal chill, like it was way colder than it was ever really like known to be in there. But I think like in this story, there was like two or three staff members that had most definitely seen this white misty apparition on the CCTV. Like it had 100% definitely been there and was real enough for them all to go like check out the Great Hall. So that was a bit weird. There's also been a bit of poltergeist, maybe even like doppelganger activity. Like this one occasion on the 24th of February, 1999, when the castle's intruder alarms went off, and this apparently like happens all the time for absolutely no reason. But the alarms were going off this one night. Obviously the police are like automatically called, but there's nothing wrong, no intruders, nothing. So the key holder for the castle, like I'm guessing the employee on call, if there's like something going on at night or whatnot, they go to the castle and like ask the alarm company to like send out an engineer, like clearly there's a fault going on. So the alarm company are like, yep, someone's on the way. They'll be there like in an hour or so. So she's there in the castle waiting for the engineer and she can hear footsteps above her, like unmistakable sound, footsteps, and then a heavy table being dragged across the floor. Okay, so like that's super weird. And she's the only person in the castle at this point. There should be no sounds, let alone sounds of people moving heavy furniture around. These noises apparently went on for an hour. I'm guessing like she was just completely like noping out. I'm like, not gonna go check on that, which I mean, yeah, I don't blame her. So eventually after that hour, the engineer shows up and she opens the door and lets him in. And he seems quite like surprised that she's like right there, ready to open the door. And she's like, well, yeah, like where else would I be? And he says, well, it's weird that you were able to travel that fast through the castle to open the door for me because I've just been waving at a woman that waved back at me from the window to the upstairs room where the furniture noises were coming from. What the fuck? Apparently apparitions staring out the window at the castle is like super common, as is like lights turning off and on on their own, doors opening and closing, like employees seeing things out the corner of their eyes, like, you know, like all the trademarks of a haunted place. But some of these other stories, there really does seem to be something there that doesn't have the nicest of intentions. So one day there were two staff members and they were walking together and they entered the gift shop. As soon as they did, they felt this like enormous pressure on them. Like some unseen force was trying to crush them, which is absolutely terrifying. For one person to experience that, like that could easily be explained away as like, your brain's doing something funky for a minute and then it's fine. Like still weird, but obviously for two people to experience the same thing, nah, that's too weird. But that's still not the worst thing that's happened to a staff member at Tamworth Castle. There was one employee that was going around like locking up for the evening and she'd reached the tower. Now, obviously there are a lot of doors to lock in a castle. So, you know, you're going through like all of the doors, like systematically locking them all, like you've done a hundred times before. Only this time she was on the stairs in the tower when the big door to the tower slammed shut and locked itself from the outside. The thing was, there was no way that this door should have done that. Like it's on this big old hook, holding it open in the courtyard. Like it should not have come undone. And she was alone at this point. Like there was no one there like playing a crappy joke or something. Like she was was trapped in that tower with no earthly reason why it should have done that. And if it wasn't for her having a radio on her, like who knows how long she would have been stuck in there and maybe like what else she would have experienced. Like what entity shut the door and what were its intentions? Like what was it gonna do? I think it's probably best not to think about it, to be honest, absolutely terrifying. And so with a history as long as Tamworth Castles and with some really bizarre stories of ancient paranormal activity, I'm really not surprised that staff members are still experiencing unexplained activity like to this day. 
But tell me, what do you think? Have you ever felt something at Tamworth Castle? Please let me know your thoughts down below. I absolutely love reading other people's ghostly experiences and stories. So Tamworth Castle will forever be burned into my memory because of that experience that I had all the way back when I was like seven. And that wasn't even paranormal. Like I just got caught out by the motion sensor. But even aside from that, like I 100% believe that this place is haunted. It's got just a super weird energy to it. It makes you feel uncomfortable in places, but even so, like it is such an amazing place to visit. If you do get the opportunity to go, like definitely do. And so let me know what you think anyway. And if you enjoyed this story, I would be forever grateful if you would hit the like button for me. And I would love to see you back here for another story sometime. So maybe if you fancy it, you might wanna subscribe. And if there are any other like haunted places or stories that you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comments. I am always up for learning new, different spooky spookyuki places. But that is all from me today. I hope you have a great day and I cannot wait to chat with you more tomorrow. So until next time, sleep safe and basically just like beat the bike, beat the Vikings, but as Tamworth pass, passel. <laughs>